Patrick, I welcome you very, very warmly this evening to the Museum Society of uh, Bombay. And I do this on behalf of the CSMBS, the chairman, Mr. Shir Sagar, who is with us this evening, along with Mrs. Shir Sagar, the director general, Mr. Mukherjee, the trustees of the museum, on behalf of my own Museum Society of Mumbai and our EC executive committee, our members on my own behalf, and on behalf of all the guests and friends who have joined us here today. We have quite a galaxy of visitors with us this evening from across the globe. Patrick, we have Dr. Saryu Doshi, Dr. Vidya Dehejal, Dr. Gomati Venkateshar, many, many. There are more than, I think, 40, 50 people on the seminar right now. And I'm really delighted on behalf of all of us to welcoming you here this evening. We had Patrick address us in 2018 in a different world, pre-pre-pandemic, when he was with us in the visitor center and he really enthralled us and regaled us about a very different character by the name of George Chinnery. And we are happy that today we've got Edward Lear with us. Edward Lear also comes with two disciplines, both poetry and painting. So thank you, Patrick, for acceding to our request once more. And as I told you earlier, I'm going to be greedy and ask you to speak to us on a subject dear to your heart sometime in January. And I'm going to just give a small teaser trailer to the audience that it's going to be on opium. But today, Patrick is going to be speaking to us on epic mountains and delineations. It's a quote, and Patrick will go into it in detail later. We're going to go through the voyages of Edward Lear with him, especially his voyage in India. He was a Victorian artist, and as everyone knows, a, no a nonsense poet. Just a few words in the form of a synopsis about what you're going to hear today. Lear, we had heard of as we were growing up as children with his famous poem, The Owl and the Pussycat. But from his early teens, he was a landscape artist by profession and an artist of great distinguished genius. He traveled here, of course, by steamer landing in our very own city of Mumbai but he'd already been through the Mediterranean and up the Nile, and his most ambitious journeys were in India from 1873 to 1875. He visited India on the invitation of the then Viceroy Lord Northbrook, who was a friend of Lear's, and that was one way people came to India with letters of introduction if they wanted to practice their art form. And of course, if they were amateur artists, they could paint whenever they wanted and wherever they wanted. Lear also kept a very detailed diary, noting his impressions and the sources of his inspiration. You'll be happy to hear, especially in times like this, that he was anxious to escape from what he called, I quote, Anglo-Saxonism, and was delighted to find that his nonsense verses were recited even in India. I read some time ago when I was preparing myself for this lecture that Patrick's train, uh, sorry, Lear's train stopped at a railway station. And he was so surprised that was, the platform was lined with children. And what were they doing? They were reciting to him the owl and the pussycat. I thought that was indeed really quite amusing. He never kept very good health, and this was one of his setbacks when he visited India. But India really was, I like to think, the great adventure of his life. And I think, Patrick, you too have made India a great adventure of your own life. Dr. Connor has written several books, Oriental Architecture in the West, of course, Chinnery, the artist of India, who went to escape his creditors to the China coast. The Hongs of Canton, a fascinating book on the Western merchants in South China, paintings of the China trade. 
He has also curated major loan exhibitions in London, Brighton, Hong Kong, exploring the relationships between the Eastern and Western cultures. He's made a documentary as well. In his career, Patrick has been the keeper of the fine art collection at the Royal Pavilion and Monuments in Brighton. And he is a consultant to the Martin Gregory Galleries in London and a specialist in historical paintings. He's a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society. So thank you very, very much, Patrick, for being with us here this evening for us in India and afternoon for you in the UK. We are really looking forward to your talk. And before I hand you over to Jason and the technical team, I would like to thank our technical team without whom we really couldn't have done these webinars. We have taught them, I hope, something about our subject matters and things that are dear to our heart. And they certainly have supported us from their side. So thank you, Jason, Yashraj, and we have today with us Aishwarya, and Rinalini. Ladies and gentlemen, if there are any subjects that you like, would, would like us to present, keeping in mind our in common interests, please write us an email and some one of us or I myself will reply to you uh, and try to engage in the topics of interest to you. So thank you very, very much for joining us this evening. And now, Patrick, we're looking forward to Edward Lear. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Over to you, Jason. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm assuming that it's my turn to, uh, to speak. Um, it's a great pleasure to be in touch with you all um, in Mumbai and elsewhere. Um, of course, we look forward to the day when we can all be in the same room together. Although I suppose during the pandemic, we have got used to these online webinars and used to the idea that we can slip away in the middle of the talk with our, our video out of action and get ourselves a cup of coffee or even a five minute nap. I confess I have done this myself on more than one occasion, but when you're actually giving the talk, of course, it's much more difficult. Um, Edward Lear, um, I don't know, my, my grandmother could recite huge chunks. My mother a little bit, my children, uh, they've only just heard of Edward Lear. They probably have heard of the owl and the pussycat and the quangle wangle's hat. Um, but uh, in all cases, Lear as an artist, I think has perhaps escaped our notice. But that's what he was. He was an artist to his fingertips. He was a professional artist from a very young age. And if I start sharing the screen now, if I can do this right, I'm hoping that this is all going in a straightforward way. That's great. Now, he was born in London uh, in 1812. So that makes him seven years older than Queen Victoria. He was the 20th child, the 20th of 21 children uh, of a stockbroker, so a middle class family, you'd say. Um, but his father defaulted. Um, he failed to pay his debts, may have gone to prison and the family split up. It's not quite clear uh, why and how, but Edward himself was brought up not in his parents' family, but by his elder sister, Anne Lear, who we see on the right-hand side. And so he didn't, he didn't go to school. She educated him in everything, Latin, Greek, drawing, uh, together with another sister. Um, so he had this rather unorthodox upbringing and Clearly drawing was something he was very good at. And from the age of 16 onwards, he was earning a living by drawing screens or fans or medical conditions for doctors, rather gruesome occupation, um, and especially natural history. And fortunately for Lear, London Zoo, which was called the Zoological Society's Gardens, um, opened to the public when he was only 17 years old. And he soon got permission to make drawings of his parrots. Parrots were what he loved particularly. Um, an early sign, I suppose, of his love of color and perhaps of strangeness and exoticism in general. And this is how he came to know Lord Stanley 
on the left, who became the 13th Earl of Derby, who was a great parrot enthusiast. And he himself had an aviary and a menagerie at Knowsley Hall outside Liverpool. In fact, it was rather larger than London Zoo. And occupied 100 acres of land and 70 acres of water. And he built up a, a network of agents all over the world who supplied him with new and exotic species. And he also financed a lot of expeditions to Africa and the Americas and was president of the Zoological Society. And he liked Lear. And Lear also got on very well with his children. He invited Lear to come and record his collection at Knowsley, which Lear did over the next five years intermittently. And his records and drawings were published later in a book called Gleanings from the Menagerie and Aviary at Knowsley Hall. But he himself was producing his own first book, started coming out uh, in sections and 12 parts when he was only 18, illustrations for the family of Sitakidae or parrots by Edward Lear. And these are life-size studies. They're impressive pictures of parrots of all different kinds. And uh, Lear would pay the printer and the hand colorist who would closely follow Lear's own drawings. Here's one of Lear's original sketches for the red and yellow macaw. And here's a rather more advanced sketch. He's filling in the details of the beak and the shoulders and the little green tips to the yellow feathers. And then we get to the final drawing, which is just a reversal of his last watercolour. And this one I've put in because it's actually Lear's own parrot. It's called Lear's macaw. And uh, it's uh, actually named after him. It wasn't until 1978 that it became officially defined as a distinct species. There are only a few left in the wild in the Amazon jungles. And uh, I've just put in a uh, Lear's picture is the one, oh, it's, it's hard to tell, isn't it? Uh, Lear's drawing must be the one on the right, and the actual parrot is on the left. And this is what it sounds like. So if you're walking along one day and you hear that, either you're in the middle of the Brazilian jungle or you're prob probably in a zoo. Whoops, sorry. And uh, this little bird was named after Lord Stanley, that's the Earl of, of Derby, Stanley's parakeet or Stanley's rosella, uh, native to the Australian regions, but now very popular as an aviary bird. And once again, uh, their history in, in aviculture begins with Lear's own lithographs. So he, his was the first uh, substantial lithographed bird book. And he's often been compa compared with Audubon, a little bit his senior, um, who produced those wonderful birds, uh, the birds of America. Uh, one difference between the two is that Audubon studied the birds in the natural habitat, then had them killed so that he could paint them, whereas Lear actually painted them uh, from the life. They remained alive um, whenever possible, at least. Once again, if you compare it with the real thing, you can see Lear is pretty close. And not just a bird, here he is painting the great orc. Now the great orc, um, the last confirmed specimens were killed in 1844 and off the coast of Iceland. They were much sought after as meat for sailors returning from long fishing journeys and their feathers and the fat and the oil and the eggs were all increasingly valuable. Um, the duck feathers were used instead of uh, eider for eider down. Um, finally, they became extinct and even stuffed ones are quite rare nowadays. This is the last stuffed great orc in Great Britain, which was given to the British Museum in 1810 on the right hand side. And this, I think, is the one which Lear has copied. And he drew animals, you see there. E. Lear Dell, August the 19th, 1832. This is his weasel. And on this occasion, he couldn't actually see the animal itself um, because it was only the, um, the dead uh, skin of the lion, which was brought back from Gujarat, in fact. And 
it was the subject of a, a scholarly paper uh, read at the Zoological Society and Lear was obliged to make a painting of the lion. This is the Asiatic lion or Indian lion, which has much less mane than most other animals and also has a distinctive longitudinal fold under its belly, which Lear hasn't actually represented. I'm sure he would have done if he could have seen the animal uh, in the wild itself. And this is Lear's drawing and we can see how it was transformed into an engraving. The engraver has made the, Lear, the, the animal look a bit happier for a start and um, he's added a bit of background as well. Uh, so just back to, to Nosley. Um, Nosley was very valuable experience for Lear, uh, apart from sketching all the animals and birds in the menagerie. He got on very well with the Earl's grandchildren. And to start off with, he was regarded as a member of staff and he had to eat downstairs with the sort of middle ranking servants while the family ate upstairs. But the children kept asking to see the funny man downstairs. And the funny man downstairs was, of course, Edward Lear, who was already starting to compose these nonsense rhymes and amusing little drawings, which the children liked so much. So in the end, uh, the Earl had to come to the top of the stairs and shout down to the servants' dining room saying, Mr. Lear, Mr. Lear, come up here. And ever after that time, uh, he would eat up in the main dining room. And indeed he got to know, as he said himself, half the fine people of the day who used to dine there. And this was very useful to him because in a number of cases, they went on to commission paintings from him. Just a few more Lear uh, drawings done for John Gould, Gould's British Birds of Europe rather. On the left, the toucan. On the right, the eagle owl with his orange eyes and sticky out ears. And one can't help in some of these drawings being reminded of his, his drawings. This is for the owl and the pussycat. On the left, the owl and the pussycat, who uh, if I put in the verse, I think so, went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. Uh, as uh, Perosa reminded us, uh, perhaps his best known of all his, his rhymes. And also one of the ones that has a, a happy ending. Or well, here again, this is his drawing of the vulture and one's reminded again of his uh, amusing little series of animals and creatures who all start with the same letter, the visibly vicious vulture. Well, some of the happiest years of Lear's life were in Rome. He went to Rome in 1837 as a young man, uh, wanting to spread his wings a bit and become a landscape artist. He complained that doing the bird studies was uh, damaging his eyesight. He spent 10 years in Rome, in fact, um, financed by uh, Lord Derby and Lord Derby's cousin. And uh, two visits back to the U UK in that time. And he taught the residents drawing and went for sketching expeditions. Here's his little drawing of one of them. Um, he went with a chap called Charles Knight who had given him riding lessons. And uh, in turn, Lear gave him lessons in Italian language. Lear was a good linguist. And here is his Lear. L is much disturbed down the bottom by several large flies. Here's a portrait of him age 28 uh, in Rome. And on one of his trips back to the UK, um, he was asked by the young Queen Victoria, um, who had read and enjoyed his book about uh, Italian scenery uh, to come and give her drawing lessons. She was, that's her self portrait on the right. She was an enthusiastic, not hugely skilled, but uh, quite a decent uh, draftswoman. And she writes in her diary that uh, Lear is an excellent teacher. He gives her a dozen lessons. And here's one of her drawings, which is inscribed New House at Osborne. That's her house in the Isle of Wight. Uh, VR, that's Queen Victoria, copied partly from Lear. This is the estate which she lived in when she decided that the Royal Pavilion at Brighton was not for her. Now, Lear's famous book of nonsense was first published in 1846, but his name didn't appear on it. Uh, it was published under the pseudonym Old Derry Down Derry, and it is in two volumes, consisted of 72 limericks, I should say that Lear didn't invent the limerick. He popularized the limerick 
Um, but um, uh, he certainly wasn't the first person to produce one. In fact, I believe the first recorded use of a limerick is in an American newspaper in 1880. Um, there was a young rustic named Mallory who drew but a very small salary. When he went to a show, his purse made him go to a seat in the uppermost gallery. Actually, rather better than some of uh, Lear's limericks, I would say. Uh, and this is a typical Lear limerick, the old man with a beard. He said, it's just as I feared, two owls and a hen, four larks and a wren have all built their nests in my beard. And these became popular, especially after 1861, when uh, this is a, a colored and more expensive edition, uh, when Lear's name first started appearing. There it is on the top right hand side. But um, people were not quite sure that Edward Lear was a real person. And this is because in the first edition, uh, there was a little tribute written by Lear to uh, the Earl of Derby and to the children at Knowsley. And people thought that it must be the Earl of Derby who'd written it and that Lear, L-E-A-R, um, is uh, simply a rearrangement of the letters E-A-R-L for Earl. So, uh, Lear was in the strange situation of having to prove to people that he was in fact the author. And this is his drawing of an episode on a train where somebody insisted on the fact that there was no Ed Edward Lear. Lear, who was sitting in the carriage, had to take off his hat and show him the label in his hat to prove that not only was there such a person as Edward Lear, but he was that person. And he does these funny little botanical sketches, many people here, upside down here, which became uh, rather better known than his paintings, although he was quite a successful artist all the while. Uh, he met uh, in the 1850s William Holman Hunt, and Holman Hunt was a group of artists known as the Pre-Raphaelites, who formed themselves together in 1848 uh, young artists, and they all believed that art had been going downhill ever since the days of Raphael, 1500 or so, and we should all get back to the earlier period, the spirit of art, in which artists weren't trying to show off their knowledge of human anatomy, but they went out and painted what they saw in front of them. And this was what William Holman Hunt tried to do. They believed in painting out actually in the open air, painting in oils, and also painting as vividly as possible using a white ground on top of which they put their pigments to give it a special vividness. This is one of Holman Hunt's pictures, which he did while he and Lear were together uh, on a farm uh, trying to follow pre-Raphaelite principles. Lear was painting a picture of the quarries of Syracuse. He'd been there in Sicily to make sketches. Here he is again, uh, the Pass of Thermopylae, which he'd also visited on his travels. Uh, being made up with pre-Raphaelite colours. And Lear was always obsessed with strange names. Um, he, like many people of his era, he knew his Greek history very well. And you can well imagine that going to Thermopylae, the famous pass where Leonidas and his 300 heroic warriors uh, prevented the Persian hordes from invading Greece. Um, but what's really going through Leo's mind is the word Thermopylae and what sort of a limerick you could make out of it. There was an old man of Thermopylae who never did anything properly. But they said, if you choose to boil eggs in your shoes, you shall never remain in Thermopylae. Well, most of, of Leo's limericks, they truly are nonsense rhymes. They don't, they're not anything like as ingenious as many modern limericks. Uh, they have quite a lot less meaning, but they're very hard to forget. And so finally to India. Now, as Feroza said, uh, her very old friend, Thomas Baring, became Earl of Northbrook. And in February, 1872, he was appointed Viceroy of India. Looks a rather severe man. Um, I think by the standards of Viceroys, he was uh, he's regarded as a, a relatively progressive one, an energetic reformer who was dedicated to uh, upgrading the quality of government, as it said, um, and he avoided wars and annexations. 
um, to a degree that others hadn't, felt that India had been overgoverned. He mounted a big relief operation for the Bihar famine of 1873, uh, in contrast to the, to the later famine when his successor, Lord Lytton, was in charge. So he had four years uh, as Viceroy and he invited his old friend Edward Lear and provided some finance so that he could make a trip around India, which lasted for uh, a year and a half. And one of the things that made India attractive to Lear at the time was he could go out through the Suez Canal, which had only been opened four years before. And uh, of course, there were steamers now which could go both ways up the Red Sea, uh, as the sailing ships had not been able to do. And it cut at least 5,000 miles off the trip, about 10 days sailing. So Lear goes down the Suez Canal, arrives in uh, Mumbai, and uh, the first thing he does, he goes off to Jabalpur and makes a drawing of the famous marble rocks, which he very much appreciates. I've just put in a, a drawing of the uh, a contemporary photograph, so you can see it's not as exaggerated as all that. Lear does tend to uh, over-dramatize his, his verticals in particular. Um, just a little detail of the monkeys, which are a great uh, feature of the place. He, in his diary, he says, sublimely beautiful, both as to color and form and brilliancy. No end of monkeys bouncing and jumping about or sitting on tree branches high above the river. Such a loveliness of marbleism one never dreamt of. Marbleism, very much a Lear word. And he catches up with his friend, the Viceroy at Lucknow. Um, although his experience at Lucknow is not altogether a happy one. He, he had to hang around and witness a Durbar and all the ceremony and formality that went with it. And he didn't enjoy that. Um, he didn't want to paint processions or receptions, he wrote in his, uh, to his friends. I believe viceregal life will bore me to death, he said. So he didn't actually travel around India with Northbrook, although he kept in constant communication with him. Instead, he traveled around, not quite on his own, because he brought his uh, Albanian manservant, Giorgio, with him. And the two of them uh, made very extensive journeys together. He says elsewhere, the, the balls and the monotonous whist or tea parties are wholly out of my line. So rather than attend to the ceremonies, he slips away to make a little sketch of the elephants in the river nearby. And then he goes on to Varanasi, uh, gets into a boat and says, how well I remember the views of Benares by Daniel R.A pallid, grey and solemn. I'd always supposed this place to be a melancholy or at least a staid and soberly coloured spot, a grey record of bygone days. Instead, I find it one of the most abundantly bruyant and startlingly radiant places full of bustle and movement. Constantinople or Naples are simply dull and quiet by comparison. So he loves drawing the gats in all their drama and here is in fact uh, Thomas Daniels, uh, Thomas and William Daniels Aquatint, and it is rather a grey and dark one. Um, one must admit, one can see his point. I'm just putting in a little detail because in so many of these watercolours by Lear, there are little, not, not quite shorthand, but abbreviated notes at the bottom, broken steps, green, uh, cindery brown. On the right are two birds, which are crows, but he always spells them C-R-O-Z-E, crows. And under the left hand one's tail is ochre, O-K-R, yellow ochre, in fact. Light off the sky is the reflection in the water. So he covers his, his it's a kind of signature, if, if you like. And these are never going to be sold, although of course they're sold nowadays, rather sought after. Uh, but they were for his personal reference when he came to doing exhibition pieces, especially oils. Now Darjeeling in many ways was the height of his visit. He made his way up north and uh, at 7 a.m. on the 17th of January, he's tired, he's been walking up the hillside the day before, but he and Giorgio set off as early as they can. Wonderful, wonderful view of Kanchenjunga, he says. And then he gets up very early next, next, next morning. We were up at the highest point above the church by seven. He finds it very cold, but he's absolutely blown away by the 
spectacle. I remember myself going to Darjeeling maybe 25 years ago, arriving late at night, uh, waking up next morning, there'd been a lot of rain and going outside. And uh, there was a thick bank of cloud um, up above. And somebody said to me, um, have you seen Kanchenjunga? And I looked up, saw the cloud and said, no. And they said, no, above the cloud. So sure enough, there was this colossal mountain right above the cloud bank, which was uh, a wonderful experience for me too. And uh, one thing he finds is that the view changes a great deal at different times of day. Uh, he, he finds the mountain godlike and stupendous, but he does worry about how to do it justice. In the morning, it's perfectly clear. And then he comes back in the afternoon and it looks quite different. He says, Kanchenjunga at sunrise is a glory not to be forgotten, but Kanchenjunga in the afternoon is apt to become a wonderful hash of Turneresque color and mint and mist and space. This is Turneresque referring to the uh, British landscape artist, J.W.M. Turner, who he regarded as the greatest landscape painter of all. Here he is again at Darjeeling and making little note, juicy going up the, the, the palm tree in the middle there, the little note saying dark creeper. So he makes a lot of these sketches, always makes a note of what time of day it is so that he can use them later on. And he made in the end, I think four different oils. There may be others that uh, haven't come to light. The two of them are at Yale at the British Arts Centre. One's at the Metropolitan Museum, one's at the National Museum of Wales. And this is a typical Lear oil composition with big uh, masses of foliage either side and then a ravine or at least a view through the centre to a distant vista, a traditional uh, composition in the manner of Claude or Poussin, I suppose. Um, but of course, he, all artists in those days really wanted to succeed in their oil paintings because that's really how you became uh, famous and how you became quite wealthy. And indeed, Lear's pictures did uh, sell for hundreds of pounds, quite considerable sum in those days, but he was never quite as successful as an oil painter as he perhaps would have hoped. Here's another version, a smaller version, which to my mind gets that, that blue color rather better of the mid ground, the different layers going gradually paler. I'm just comparing it with a modern photograph of the same. And when you look at the modern photograph, he's clearly uh, taking a lot of trouble to get the detail of the distant peaks correct. And here's the group of rather generalized figures at the bottom and there's just a detail of the mountain at the top. Now, Holman Hunt and the Pre-Raphaelites soon rather faded from view, but a painting that he particularly admired was by Frederick Church, the most famous American landscape painter of the 19th century. And this picture of Frederick Church is called Heart of the Andes, was shown in New York. It was a huge success. It was a one painting show and people paid quite a lot of money to get in and they sat in benches, they brought their binoculars so that they could look at the details. And it uh, shows Mount uh, Chimborazo, Ecuador on the left-hand side. The point was to show different kinds of vegetation that you might find at different altitudes and all painted um, in minute detail. And Lear used to say he was the greatest landscape painter after Turner. His picture of the heart of the Andes hangs always before me in his imagination. Uh, that is. And after New York, it was shown in London, where Lear was able to see it. There's Mount Chimborazo. This was mm, 12 or 13 years before he arrived in India. Now, Agra causes him a bit of a problem. Of course, he, he loves the, the Taj. He, no words can describe it. What a garden, what flowers, what gorgeously dressed and beringed women, effects of colour astonishing, the great centre being ever the vast glittering ivory white Taj Mahal. But what can I do here, he says, certainly not the architecture, which I shall naturally not attempt, except perhaps in a slight sketch. And that's what he does. There's no oil painting. I think Lear always felt that um, he was not in any sense an archeologist or an antiquarian um, or an architect, and that detailed architectural paintings of India had been done already by other people, by the Daniels, perhaps by the Hodges, by Ferguson, 
and that it wasn't his forte. I, I think Leo was an artist through and through. He was an aesthete before that word became very common. And his response was always to the texture, to the colors, to the composition. And uh, he shied away from detailed paintings of architecture while still appreciating it. This is uh, what he calls the beautiful rosy fort at Agra, perfectly lovely. One great line of rose color barring the silver ivory mosques, a deep, deep rose and silver reflex in the river. And he goes on to Gwalior. Uh, approach to Gwalior fine, a long, absolutely isolated rock, he says. And this is a composition I'm familiar with because in the uh, museum near the pavilion at Brighton, where I used to work, is the oil painting derived from that sketch. And um, interesting thing is how much more he's tried to dramatize the oil painting. I've put the two together. He's made the banks, hasn't he, much taller than they actually were in the sketch. He's introduced more shadow. He's got the dark elephants at the edge of the river. Uh, I, he was very conscious of the fact that painting, an oil painting had to have what people describe as wall power. It's not the same at all as a, a sketch, which is going to go into your portfolio and be used only for reference. Uh, but at Poor, he does uh, street scenes, rather unusual. He, he very much enjoys this, the long streets there, broad and well paved, flanked each side by shops raised on a broad platform, each shop being an archway surrounded by stonework of the most elaborate workmanship, with cornices above and galleries and verandas that very much takes his fancy. And then on to Vrindaban. Fully the most wholly Indian and completely picturesque place I have seen since Benares, he says. And he comes to the river. There was no sun, only a faint veil of cloud everywhere. So I was able to work well. No more thoroughly Indian scene can I ever see. The lovely gentle color of the whole is a charm hardly to be expressed. Um, and uh, but clearly that the, the beautiful scene was not all he was thinking of, because he also writes in his journal, adjourned to the immense roots of a banyan tree for breakfast, where we had claret and soda water, cold roast lamb, hard boiled eggs and good bread. So beautiful scenes are one thing, but you need a good breakfast as well. Just comparing it with the Daniels uh, painting um, in this particular picture, uh, Thomas Daniel combines the architecture and the foliage uh, in dramatic fashion, but in his aquatint, which is probably the one which uh, would have been known to Lear, you get a rather austere uh, picture of the monolithic temples from around the, the other side. And Lear was very conscious of what had been done before him. Doesn't spend long in Delhi, um, which he found a, quite a, a, a ruinous place in those days. It doesn't prevent him from making jokes and puns about Delhi and delicate and indelibly and deleterious water. Um, he moves on there uh, to Shimla. And uh, here all is either civil or military. He doesn't like either of those much. One large sanitarium. Uh, he does appreciate the mountain views though. The north view is nearly all exquisite pearl pink lemon haze. And he likes the, the large ilex, the golden ilex, and the rhododendron is a mass of red. And uh, the conifers up at the higher altitudes. He loves his trees much more than his architecture. And the rhododendrons he makes a lot of sketches of. Here we are. Lots of scratchy detail and wants to get it exactly right. Each little layer of the flower has a slightly different color, which is annotated. Well, here's a whole page of rhododendron flowers with birds looking through and precise instructions he's made for when he comes to make a painting, if he does. Um, you feel Leah is an obsessive. Uh, he's the kind of artist whose whole life has to be spent drawing. He's unhappy if he can't. And he was well aware that a lot of these drawings were not going to be used for making paintings, but it was his life. It, it was what he felt driven to do. And he made about 2000 of them. 
uh, in the course of his time in India. Oops, excuse me. Uh, in Pune, it rained a lot. Um, but he does, did some very attractive pictures, I think, and they were on blue-gray paper. It gives a slightly different effect. He'd been told that there was nothing to be seen in Pune, uh, and he was pleased to discover that it was completely untrue. And he does lots of drawings, in all of which it's fair to say the architecture is upstaged by the, the foliage and the people and the street scenes. These are all views. He loves the the verticals of the, the trunks and the banyans. Um, then he makes his way over to the uh, southeast. He goes to Chennai, and here's the beach, Madras, 28th of August, 1874. And from here, he takes a steamer uh, down the coast to Mahabalipuram, which is full of interest. And now we see him painting the temples rock hewn, he writes, very rounded and old. Um, Mahabalipuram was a place that a number of artists had visited. Um, I remember Feroza wrote a very interesting piece about James Ferguson's visit there um, in the uh, CSMVS journal, was it about three years ago? And um, Ferguson must have been there uh, 30 odd years before Lear, and he was just the sort of artist that Lear was, had at the back of his mind, and he realized he, he could never be a Ferguson, he could never do the, the uh, precisely delineated, archaeologically correct drawings that Ferguson had done. So he makes these drawings of the rock-cut temples, but when he does the oil painting, it's completely different. And the stars of the show here are those, these colossal clumps of palms, and the uh, architecture has really become a minor feature in his huge dramatic painting. This is now in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And here are the so-called Shaw temples at Mahabalipuram, um, which um, haven't got much foliage close to them. They're not gonna make it quite a suitable oil painting for Lear. I've put in there my own photograph on the bottom right and George Chinnery's uh, sketch done in about 1805 on the top right. They, they haven't changed a great deal. I know a certain amount of restoration has taken place. Uh, and it was here, as Feroza said, that uh, Liam makes his remark. He loves the place so unique and ancient and unmixed by modernism or Anglo-Saxonism. Anglo-Saxonism sums up a a variety of things he doesn't like. He doesn't like hierarchies. He doesn't like formal British social life. Um, and in fact, he made his home away from Britain for the last few years of his life, as we'll see in just a second. Well, just very much in passing, um, I've put the two together, George Chinnery and Edward Lear, because I do think they're kindred souls in some ways. Um, they are both, well, eccentric figures. They both, prided themselves on their ugliness. Lear describes himself uh, in a little poem. He says, his mind is concrete and fastidious. His nose is remarkably big. His visage is more or less hideous. His beard, it, remain, it resembles a wig. And Chinnery on the left also prided himself in Macau as being the ugliest man on the China coast. Um, Moreover, they both had this obsessional attitude to drawing, to going out early in the morning, to making a note of exactly where and when you were doing the, doing the picture. They're not quite the same in their drawing style. Here I'm comparing Chinnery's early 19th century drawing of the Masula boatman, the catamaran in the foreground on the uh, uh, beach at uh, Chennai and the same boats by Lear below. Uh, waiting to take people out to the bigger ships in the bay. And I've just put in a, a chinnery drawing of the hut in Bengal because he adds this shorthand. You can see all the shorthand around it. Um, top right, the figure rather too small. And then on the bottom, it's, uh, whoops, 
didn't mean to go back quite yet. He's got the, the date. And little things which you might imagine were just squiggles turn out to be bits of shorthand, giving the, the, the color notes uh, red and mud and things of that kind. So a pair of obsessives. Now, uh, we're coming to our close now. He has a month in Sri Lanka. Uh, before leaving, which is rather overshadowed by the fact that he's not very well, he's getting tired, and Giorgio in particular has a bad bout of dysentery. Uh, he goes first of all to Gaul, this is a little sketch of breadfruit leaves, and I'm um, looking up online, I see that in Gaul there's a beach hotel called Owl and the Pussycat, which prides itself on being the most runcible hotel in the world, runcible being one of Lear's nonsense words that uh, means nothing at all. So uh, I've never been to Sri Lanka, but if I do, I think I shall try and call in at the Owl and the Pussycat. And here's his picture of Adam's Peak at Ratnapura in the Central Highlands. Uh, I, I think this is one of my favorite drawings of his. You just get the sensation that it's been heavily raining and just beginning to, to clear. And you rather lose that wonderful freshness when it's turned into an oil painting, dramatic though it is. Once again, you've got Leo's favorite composition of the two masses of foliage and the sunlit vista between. So he then makes his way back by steamer, takes three weeks to get back to Mumbai. Here's a little drawing of Malabar Hill. And from here, he goes home, home no longer being uh, Britain, although he has a couple more visits to make. Uh, he settled now in San Remo in Northwestern Italy uh, on the edge of the Mediterranean with uh, Giorgio, his Albanian manservant, and also Giorgio's sons after Giorgio's wife had died. Um, Giorgio spoke uh, 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 Greek and Albanian and Italian, but not English. Uh, Leah tried to teach him English, but was not successful. So they had to converse in, in Greek and Italian, but they seem to have managed extremely well for quite a long time. Um, just on a personal level, but before we draw to a close, I should mention that Lear's was never a very happy life. He, subject from, he was subject to what we would now call mood swings, deep depressions. He had asthma, and in particular, he had epilepsy at a time when there was a social stigma attached to epilepsy, and he never mentioned it. He just made little marks in his diary uh, for the days, quite a few of them there were, when he suffered epileptic attacks. And he was uh, never a happy man, I would say. He was a driven man and um, on many occasions, a lovely man to be with, uh, but then he would swoop down into deep depression again. And uh, luckily Giorgio lived on until a few years before uh, Leo himself died. This is the last house they lived in at San Remo. And uh, after the death of Giorgio, Leo's only companion was Foss, his, uh, his dog. Um, Foss, uh, as you see, has got a very short tail. That's because Giorgio cut his tail off um, in the belief that a cat wouldn't wander away from a house where if it had left its tail. This happened shortly before uh, Leo left for India with Giorgio leaving Foss behind. Well, unlike Foss, Leo had been a great traveler and India, as Feroza says, I think was his most ambitious and his most fulfilling adventure. And with that, I'll draw to a close, except just to mention one thing, and that's that many of Lear's Indian watercolors are now in the Houghton Library at Harvard. And it has an excellent website from which I have taken a number of the uh, watercolors in this presentation. And I do urge you to check it out very nice high resolution you can look in at close detail at the uh, admirable mr lear thank you <laughs>